when we talk about appropriate technology in the context of this course, it refers to all those types of methods, technologies that are doing something more sustainable, meaning the actual technology itself is very well in sync with the natural environment, with the social environment, um, and all the resources that are locally available. So the word appropriate can mean lots of things in our current society, but in this case, it just means using something that's um, to scale with what, we've, what we're working with, the system we're working with, um, with human limits, with the ecosystems, well, well within the ecosystem's limits, and it improves the site, um, the piece of land, or what, whatever we're talking about, the system, it, um, it helps it, and it replenishes it to some degree. So there's usually some net capital gain of capital. You, you have extra time or extra resources or extra food, something, there's a surplus created as opposed to the deficit kind of culture and technology that we use these days that has um, lots of negative effects. So it's not a silver bullet. Appropriate technology in this lecture is just talking about some um, some alternative methods of doing things, generating energy, for one example, um, that is um, as it produces a lot less waste and it's more locally um, situated and it can um, improve the system while providing for what we need as well. So let's go on to look at what appropriate technology is. And this lecture is just a smattering of examples of things that are less conventional, but more um, ecologically sound and potentially more appropriate for humans to use while we're living here on this earth. So appropriate, like I said, can mean lots of different things. It can mean like if you're inappropriate, you've said something offensive or culturally um, wrong. Um, this is not talking about that kind of appropriate. And I bring that up only to say that this isn't about pointing a finger at how bad our current systems are. Um, that is one form of or one method of affecting change to point a finger and point out all the wrongs that are happening in our current systems. Um, but along with that, it's really important um, to, to also um, provide solutions, new alternatives of how things can be better. Um, ideas, programs, solutions, technologies that, um, that will um, not produce the waste or the negative effects of our current systems. So um, we have to provide solutions too, not just point out what's wrong. So appropriate technology is a technology that is, um, uh, it's including the local environment, including the animals and the plants and the people and the social networks and the invisible structures that we'll talk more about. Um, it takes it all into account and um, tries to provide the needs for all those things as uh, with, with the lowest amount of waste and the littlest amount of inputs. So Again, these are just some examples um, of kind of, I think they're fun because they really get you thinking outside the box about ways we can do things that we're so used to doing things one way. And then you get these ideas like, oh, this is even a simpler, less expensive, less polluting solution. Why aren't we using that? There's a lot of answers to that question, but hope you enjoy some of these examples. We've really already talked about appropriate dwellings in our natural buildings um, lecture and talks. So this is just another example that I showed you in the last lecture too, but Cobb houses are one example of an appropriate dwell uh, dwelling that's locally um, based, meaning the resources come from the local environment. We have a lot of clay here. And this is that Cobb house that was built in um, Thailand. So it's not local to here, but clay is local to there too. And for very cheaply, but very beautifully too. It creates a very, um, you know, attractive living space. There's really nothing negative about this if you compare it to your, your current home. You might not like the style, but um, it still provides a safe, comfortable environment um, that's also pleasing. So this is one of them um, that I got to hear uh, this woman, Anna Eddy, speak in Ohio about 15 years ago. And she, um, her whole shtick is she is adding on um, a, a greenhouse, basically, to one side of an existing house, a whole glass 
wall added on to conventional homes. Usually here, this is showing you Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off of the Cape of Massachusetts. So it's cold over there, really cold. And she took a conventional home and added this big wall of glass on the south facing side, which is facing the, the sun's more direct exposure in the northern hemisphere here. And um, she, through that passive solar um, type of design, she was able to um, maintain 80 degrees Fahrenheit in general inside her home passively. So no gas, no electricity used. It was just the solar itself that heated up the home and inside the home were thermal masses like um, jugs and bricks of water, stone, things that could absorb the sun during the day and emanate that at night. Um, her main goal wasn't about being um, creating heat for the home. Her main goal was um, what she started was wastewater treatment, that no wastewater would come off of the home, out of the, the sewers, I mean, out of the toilets, or the, anywhere else in the house, that all that water would be treated and stay on site. And she created a um, sustainable, all-natural wastewater, wastewater treatment system that was similar to like our septic system, overall general design, but it used all natural products and microbes and really porous um, types of rocks in it to house those microbes, those, that system did all the degradation of the human waste. Um, our conventional septic system uses chemicals and it's not good for the environment. So um, self-contained wastewater treatment, she was able to grow fruits and vegetables inside that greenhouse side of the house um, all year long. She, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a great picture she showed in her talk that shows her in her bathtub right inside this glassed in kind of greenhouse part of the house. She's in her bathtub taking a bath and reaching up and grabbing a, a grape off a grapevine that's hanging and growing up there. So really neat ideas, really simple, least effect for the greatest change. You can just add to an existing structure and um, it becomes much more appropriate environmentally. This is Anna Eddy in her indoor garden um, this is actually not her house, but someone else's house that she designed, adding on this wall of glass that really looks like a conventional wall with a lot of windows. It can be made to look um, funky, you know, like a hippie house, or it can be made to look very normal, um, but still provide a, a greenhouse effect inside that house for passive heating and growth of a lot of great plants. Another example of Anna Eddy's um, home design on the outer um, greenhouse that she added onto a conventional home and you can look at just the high production of food that comes from that site. There's some hydroponic, um, looks like grains being grown in PVC pipes that are suspended there by ropes and then things in raised beds as well. And this is in Anna Eddy's, her former home um, in Martha's Vineyard where I just love this picture of all these plants growing in the middle of winter and she's got her bathtub with her hot water um, heated by solar um, that she can take a bath almost like outside but it's inside the house and it's warm and verdant. Next let's look at a few examples of appropriate energy production. So again energy producing systems that use less energy, less materials, less resources, produce less waste. They're not perfect but they're better.
This is an example, and I'll let you read through some of this on your own, but um, of, I'm gonna actually jump to the next slide um, and show you the pictures of this um, technology, which is using small wind turbines, so not so different than the one I just showed you, but smaller scale and placed on existing electrical, in the electrical grid of power lines and telephone poles and things like that designed by these French designers, architects, and it installed in a few places in the world, but not as many as um, they had hoped. So something like this was part of their uh, de design concept. They won an award for, but the yellow part are little turbines stuck, placed within the existing high voltage power lines and towers. So what it, it's taking is the existing structure, which we've got thousands and thousands of miles of this all over the United States, and um, kind of arming it with um, local electrical generation. One of the negatives of these big power lines is they're taking, like for here in California, we're taking um, electricity that's produced in the four corners part of the country and you know a few states away through coal burning and put into the electrical transmission lines like this, and we lose a lot of electricity just by frictional losses, et cetera, traveling so far. So this localizes that. It's kind of a neat idea. Another design for a different type of tower. And even a really small scale one for just small scale telephone poles or small trans transmission lines. TROM is another type of system that is been around for quite a while. Um, have you ever heard of the fact that the ancient Romans were able to make ice? This is how they did it. So if you start on the upper left of that little diagram, you have water um, go into an intake, some kind of pipe, screen, grate that the water falls into, and it goes through some kind of grate which oxygenates it. It kind of swirls and splashes around, so bubbles get oxygen bubbles get put into the water. And as it falls down a vertical um, distance, those bubbles, if it falls far enough, it gets, those bubbles get compressed. And at the bottom, that compressed air can be used as an energy source. Um, it also gets colder too, and it can be used to cool things. So this is just a completely mechanical, not even really any moving parts, no energy needed to run it and it creates compressed air, which can be used, again, for coolant or for creating energy. It, it, the compressed air has pressure to it. It can be, when it's released, when it goes back up, it can be used to spin a turbine to create electricity. Um, and this is how the Romans made up. A little more detail is the water has to fall down oh, at least 130 foot of vertical falling um, for the compressed air to get um, compressed, those air bubbles. The mining industry uses that in um, underground mine shafts to create electricity and power. So it's really cool. Um, the um, trolley system in Chicago, before they got their um, coal and electric powered L, um, used to be run by this. And then the coal industry kind of took over. Fossil fuel had big lobbyists and um, they decided it was better. Um, probably cheaper to go this other way, although this didn't cost anything once it was installed. There's some more information, um, text about that, if you want to read about it. This is this system is a biogas digester. It is using um, the same kind of idea that Jean Pan used. It's, he didn't, Jean Pan did not make up that idea, but um, taking organic matter, putting it in a closed container, um, there's bacteria all over the organic matter and the anaerobic bacteria that like that situation with no oxygen will create methane and the methane can be taken off the top. So this could be done not just with wood chips, but it could be done with dung, like um, you know, manure also, and any kind of organic matter that can be happening. And the, again, you get gas, you get use of what was considered waste and you get a compost. Some other types of gas digesters used throughout the world. This is just a joke. But I liked this postcard I saw. We can get uh, 
certain uh, demographic to get out there and ride their bicycles that the people that need it and generate electricity that way. Vortex water purification. Um, this is a very simple design, an ancient design of putting water through a funnel like shape causes it to swirl and and that swirling um, action uses a centrifugal force and what it does is it forces the, the water out to the sides and the heavier particulates and even heavy metals will coalesce in the center and they can be taken out um, through a simple process. So it's really, you could put this on your shower head where it's taking out some of the um, particulates and some of the nasty stuff that's a little bit bigger molecules that will get um, pushed into the center and then can be filtered out. And there's no electricity used. There's, this is just, um, it's, it's really simple and you don't need a lot of resources. Vortex water purification, um, this is a very simple design, an ancient design of putting water through a funnel-like shape causes it to swirl and, and that swirling um, action uses a centrifugal force and what it does is it forces the, the water out to the sides and the heavier particulates and even heavy metals will coalesce in the center and they can be taken out. Um, through a simple process. So it's really, you could put this on your shower head where it's taking out some of the um, particulates and some of the nasty stuff that's a little bit bigger molecules that will get um, pushed into the center and then can be filtered out. And there's no electricity used. There's, this is just, um, it's, it's really simple and you don't need a lot of resources. And there's a little more information on it that you can read through. Um, some of the tests show that it, um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is the swirling also oxygenates the water. In oxygenation of water, it um, kills a lot of the, the bacteria that are aquatic. So um, that's good. And we have less need for chlorine and something um, tri called triclosan, which is in a lot of our water um, and products we use and somewhat ingest like mouthwash or toothpaste that is... Um, it's a, it's a bad chemical for living creatures. So this helps with that. Terra Preta is uh, another ancient type of technology which has applications for today. Um, the Europeans, when they first um, encountered some of these Amazonian natives, pre-Columbian, long time ago, 500 years ago, um, they um, noticed um, certain practices and later um, it, researchers found these same types of spots within the overall Amazon forest. They would see spots where the soil was different, even the plants were different. There was really high fertility patches and these were um, traced back to and linked to these old practices that were seen in the long-term past of the of Amazon natives, some of them, and there's many different tribes, but some of them were burning um, wood. They would take like down trees and logs and cover them, even some green material and, and agricultural waste and cover it with soil and burn it with very little oxygen. And that caused this, um, a type of kind of charcoal making that, was, that we would call biochar today has lots of surface area, lots of homes for microbes and worms and things. And these places where that was done in the distant, in the, in, historically, are places where the soil today is still very fertile and increasing in fertility over time, if left, as opposed to most soils, which decrease in fertility. So it's a very simple technique. It is known, people, people are using it now with like biochar and you can buy that and it's really great to add to soil to increase fertility, but it could be used on a wider scale in agriculture. So just a little bit more information about it. We have issues with climate change now and, and biochar soils can sequester a significantly greater amount of carbon than regular soils. 
This is a picture of um, biochar being made, but it's not being made for soils or agriculture. This is the Jack Daniels distillery in Tennessee. And um, what they're doing here is the way they form these piles of logs um, creates a, um, a low oxygen burning fire. So in, because they're kind of in a, in a ring in a tower, the oxygen gets sucked back in and this becomes a very slow smoldering burning of the wood. And they use that, they don't call it biochar, that charcoal that looks kind of like this when it's done. This is what it looks like when the charcoal is done. Um, they use that to distill their uh, spirits through and make a really clean, pure distillation um, liquor. Application of biochar to soils um, in just a few years can transform it from a very nutrient poor soil on the left to a very dark fertile soil on the right. And this was by adding it to the top. It wasn't mixing it in. So it can increase the soil biology, which increases the health of the plants and the roots and the microorganisms that reach down on their own. John Pan composting. Um, this is a composting technique that um, I'm gonna, I have some links to the videos that I want you to watch and summarize. Um, this is uh, a man, a French innovator who lived in the countryside in France, a lot of brushy um, countryside he lived in, kind of similar to Chaparral of Santa Barbara. And he developed a compost-based energy system that produced 100% of his own energy needs. He would chip clear brush and take the wood chips from that and build a big pile, huge pile, you can kind of see him standing there, and um, make a compost, a big compost pile. And while he was building it, he would um, do a couple of things. Um, he would put in a black, like poly pipe, like um, black, just plastic pipe inside of it. So when uh, compost started to heat up, he would be able to heat water and get hot water from that huge compost pile. He also took partially digested uh, wood chips and put them into the center of the pile and um, inside a, uh, a metal closed cylinder. You can see it kind of in the upper, that middle picture. He's got a steel tank in the center. He's got partially um, composted chips put into that and put that into an anaerobic system. So then he wraps um, that with maybe some pipe for, for um, heating and from, for heating water and then puts all the wood chips around that. And so what he's getting from this big compost pile that are just from the, it's just from the, um, the wood chips in his, on his property that he would have had to burn um, the wood for fuel or somehow get rid of the wood chips. Now he's turning them into a source of heating water, and he was able to heat water, um, a lot of it, and also um, 18 months of hot water from one large pile, also creating, um, um, let's see, it's biogas from that central tank when he puts the partially digested wood chips slurry into that tank. It's an anaerobic system, no oxygen is going in anaerobic fermentation occurs and methane is produced and the methane can be used just like propane, a cooking fuel. It's not so different than what happens in our garbage dumps um, here in the United States. You know, we, we put all this garbage and pile it up, pile it up and anaerobic fermentation occurs and we get a lot of methane escaping out of the dump. And these days dumps like Tahigas here in just north of Santa Barbara in Galita, they take that gas, uh, excuse me, the uh, methane gas that is produced and they um, gather it and use it for fuel and sell it. Well, so he was able to do that. He gets hot water, he gets gas, he gets also compost, and that can be used, turning those wood chips from the dry, brushy habitat of his property. Now he's also getting really good garden soil too. So here are the links to the YouTubes telling you more about um, Jean Pan's compost method. Um, there are subtitles, but it is in German but I want you to watch those and write a summary about those, about a page long. Thank you. And this is another link to um, the Jean Pan method that was used 
at Quail Springs, closer here to Santa Barbara, just trying to a very small scale facsimile of what was done by John Cannon and friends. This is an example of just passive air cooling in Quail Springs. The co-director Warren Brush, this is his um, little Cobb house out at Quail Springs. And what you're seeing is on the left in the foreground is the intake pipe where water, or excuse me, air will, would just passively go into this um, pipe that's sticking out, the white pipe, just, just under that green fabric. And it travels along underground um, over three feet down all the way to the house, goes into the house and there's an outlet inside the, the floor of the house where the air comes out. And then on the top of the house on the roof, you can see a little um, pipe sticking out. That's where the hot air comes out and the hot air coming out of the top the roof of that house um, pulls in air at the at this um, little structure with, with the green cloth. So passively hot air is coming out of the house, pulling in air that's under underground, the cooler air underground, and it's keeping that cooler overall. So a little bit of information about that geo air conditioning intake pipe. Um, goes down at least four feet, and usually the temperature is around 53 degrees Fahrenheit that far down. And so um, as hot air leaves the, the ceiling of that dwelling, cool air from underground is pulled in, and warm air is pulled out from the intake pipe, but it cools down once it goes below, down to the um, lateral pipe. Here's a kiva that is part of a natural a Pueblo Indian um, dwelling and place to go, a uh, spiritual place, but also just a dwelling and a place to stay cool. And you can see that it's underground. So the same thing, they're taking advantage of that same idea. And you can see behind the ladder, there's kind of a dark, it looks like a little shaft going horizontally backwards. So those are the shafts um, where cool air will flow in from an above ground intake. So they, they understood this idea. It's very simple. Very cheap, very appropriate. Uh, same thing. I did not take this picture, but it's a really beautiful underground system of staying cool in a hot climate. 